Chapter 27. Chapter 27 is on immunology uh, or the uh, immunologic disorders, basically problems with the immune system. So um, the significant uh, portion of this chapter that we're concerned with is the uh, allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. However, we'll also touch on a few other things such as issues with uh, being immunocompromised as well as things like auto, a few autoimmune disorders. Understand that all of the medicine that we study in, the, in this uh, course and in this section, um, these are, are barely the tip of the iceberg for many, many, many of these fields. So, I mean, you're always going to run into things that you're not going to be terribly familiar with. Um, even, even now, with uh, you know the current version of EMS providers, we're still learning. We're learning a lot more about the non-emergent things. Um, and really, when we're talking immunologic disorders uh, outside of uh, anaphylaxis, there's not a lot in this chapter uh, that is immediately life-threatening. Not something that people would consider emergent in most cases. Uh, so. You know, we're, we're always going to be finding new things, and I encourage you, as you continue your practice uh, and your and your to be lifelong learners in, in EMS, that when you run into something uh, that you're not familiar with, we'll take for example, um, maybe um, something like lupus. Um, we may touch on lupus briefly, but I encourage you when you run into patients with that or a person that has lupus um, or something like that, that you take a few moments after your call or when you have a few minutes after, you know, maybe meeting this person or, or going even to a continuing education course on it, take a few minutes, do a web search, learn a little bit more about it, find a, a medical encyclopedia to learn more about it. Um, that's the way that that uh, active learners and people who are continuing to grow in their practice uh, expand their, their horizons. Um, we can't teach you everything in your initial course. So much of it relies on experience. And so um, that would be my, my word of advice to you there. Um, as with all the chapters, simply listening and watching the lectures no replacement to uh, reading and studying, so do that at your earliest convenience if you haven't already. <clears throat> we continue the same theme of the education standard that applies here, applying fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based on the assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. Uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, videos that you can watch from the uh, non-narrated PowerPoint uh, anaphylaxis and the allergic rhinitis video. Um, most of us probably get to experience allergic rhinitis, so we may not be a uh, we, we may have first-hand knowledge of, uh, of allergic rhinitis, but it's still kind of cool to see how it actually works. Um, allergic rhinitis, if you're not familiar with that, is our common environmental allergies. So, our objectives, uh, as you can find on pages 663 and 664 in your textbook, um, there's a, a few of them here. We'll shuffle through. All right, the introduction. Now, our body has specific, non-specific and specific uh, defenses against certain diseases. So, a good example of this non-specific: your skin and your mucous membranes. If we have good intact skin, we have a very good defense against uh, most of the pathogens that surround us on a daily basis. We also have those specific defenses, be it a, a certain type of white blood cell, whether it's a, a neosinophil or a lysinophil, or, uh, or maybe it's a you know, a very specific antigen in our blood. Maybe we we have, uh, I'm sorry, antibodies in our blood. So we may have something like, um, you know, type B antibodies in our blood that protect us from, from uh, that type of blood. So 
We have some that are very specific, some that are very uh, non-specific. They protect us from a multitude of pathogens encountered every day. And, and we've got all these things that we don't, we, we probably take for granted and don't think twice about. The hairs within your nose, uh, the saliva in your mouth that has, you know, some um, acidic properties to it. Uh, the stomach uh, acids that you have, uh, the, your, your skin, your uh, you know, various membranes. I mean, there's so many things that we don't even think about. Even, even the mucociliated escalator in our lungs that will move uh, different foreign materials out of the lungs and uh, get it uh, deposited into uh, our pharynx for uh, removal. And when protection against disease fails, illnesses that normally would not pose a serious risk uh, can be life-threatening. So for most of us, you know, about with uh, a cold or, or even the flu. We'll take the flu, for example, because the flu is a serious illness. But most of us are, are strong, um, healthy people. And also the flu knocks us on our butt for a couple of days, a week, 10 days, something like that, depending on how severe we get it. Uh, whereas somebody who maybe has had an organ transplant and is immunocompromised, and they have to be immunocompromised to keep their body from rejecting it the organ, uh, may very well uh, succumb to that illness simply because it, it is a, a serious illness. It's a strong illness, um, but uh, you know, they don't have the ability to, to uh, rid themselves of it. When you think about it, it goes with your case study. Um, <clears throat> what are the findings that we differentiate between mild allergic reaction from an allergic from an anaphylactic reaction, and how does the treatment for a mild allergic reaction differ from that from an anaphylactic reaction? We're actually going to get to that, so I'm going to skip over that, and that actually still kind of goes with the case study there. All right, so our nonspecific defenses. We have mechanical and we have chemical. So like I mentioned, good intact skin. You know, when we have viruses, we have um, bacteria, fungi, various parasites, that are around us on a daily basis. Um, we're, we're, we're coming into contact with them. Um, and provided that we have this good barrier, which is actually our best uh, barrier against infection, is good, strong, intact skin, uh, we have little to worry about. Mucous membranes, much the same way. I talked about saliva, something called salivary amylase, uh, which goes in there and it, it starts to break stuff down. There's other uh, juices in our saliva that help um, break this stuff down and also uh, provide defenses. Uh, we also have some antimicrobial substances such as the blood and interstitial fluid which tend to be a little bit more um, uh, resistant to a lot of the, of the microbes out there. Nothing that we have though is completely without, uh, without fault, without uh, potential issue to allow some uh, infections in. Um, so we, the mechanical ones are, are the things like our different membranes and, uh, and the chemical ones uh, have various juices that are, are secreted. Other nonspecific defenses, we have things such as the natural killer cells, phagocytosis, inflammation, and fever, which go along with this. Uh, natural killer cells are a type of lymphocyte, which if you remember is a type of a white blood cell. Phagocytosis is the method that a couple of the different types of white blood cells use to destroy other um, pathogens, or to, to destroy pathogens, I should say other pathogens, but to destroy pathogens by surrounding it, eating it, breaking it down. Um, inflammation and fever. Fever actually it can be connected in there with inflammation because it's usually um, Heat uh, is a form of that, as a, uh, a sign of inflammation. Uh, it's something the body does, says, hey, let's just burn it up. Let's burn it off. Um, hopefully it can't survive. Well, um, we can also have something systemic where the fever is uh, something that raises our, our entire body's temperature, not just in the area. So many of you may have had a, an infection. Um, with, you know, let's say you've gotten a sliver or something. Uh, it starts to get warm, hot, it's tender to the touch, or not warm, hot, warm, pink, maybe a little swollen, tender to the touch. Those are all signs of inflammation. Uh, it's all part of the, the process. 
So to develop uh, resistance to a disease is called immunity. That shouldn't be new to anybody there. Um, substances that are recognized uh, by our immune system uh, as foreign provoke an immune response uh, are called antigens. So uh, antigens and antibodies can be easily confused. Remember, uh, genesis is the creation. So what causes it to create a, pro a process or, or a response would be an antigen. An antibody is something that is created by our body to fight off an antigen. So hopefully that can help you keep that, uh, that, keep that straight. So what is the specific resistance to a disease? I just mentioned that. That is um, immunity. And then the substances that are recognized to, uh, as foreign and provoke it, that is the antigen. And then what carries out the functions of the immune system? Um, a variety of things. Lymphocytes um, are some of our primaries. Uh, but there's other things, the, the antibodies, the, the various um, uh, classes of antibodies uh, referred to as uh, things like immunoglobulins. We have five major classes of immunoglobulins. Um, immunoglobulin IgE uh, is the antibody involved in uh, allergic and anaphylactic reactions, which comprise less than a tenth of a percent of all antibodies. So there's a large number of these. We have, have no, no, we don't have the time uh, to go into all of these different types of antibodies. And like I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg when, when we're talking about these things. So when an antigen is rec recognized, our body then dispatches histamine and heparin, which we talked about this um, in uh, chapter 26 a little bit, uh, and other chemical mediators uh, of inflammation are released. So we may have some cystokinines and whatnot. Uh, that are dispatched to the area. And that inflammatory response uh, to the histamine and heparin is usually localized and beneficial. So like I said, we have those signs of inflammation, which are heat and swelling and whatnot, um, uh, redness. Uh, remember, that's part of the inflammatory response, and it's triggered by some of the histamine and heparin. Um, in anaphylaxis, it goes from beyond one little area and becomes systemic or body-wide, and it often is exaggerated. So yes, it, it, it is kind of an over-the-top uh, response. So this shows us a, a little bit of the process of um, facing a, a life-threatening anaphylactic reaction. Typically, anaphylaxis will occur somewhere within about, well, several minutes, um, several seconds, or you know, up to a minute or so, but it can really be delayed. So in more cases than not, it's very rapid. Uh, but once in a while, somebody will, will take a little bit of time before it actually starts to, uh, to uh, exaggerate. The picture we have here on the on the slide is on page 666, 666 in your text. Um, and it talks us through some of the things we see occur during anaphylaxis. Um, first of all, when we have that um, exposure and our body then starts to react and dispatch the various mediators, uh, we get to see three significant uh, areas that it affects. First is it causes severe bronchoconstriction. Secondly, capillary permeability. And thirdly, vasodilation. Some of this is in, in, a, uh, uh, in a response to try to rid the body of it or keep it out. So with some bronchoconstriction, we try to keep stuff out. We might have some capillary permeability, try to wash it away as things kind of get leaky a little bit there, try to create a little bit of, of, a, uh, of a wash. And then vasodilation can be as a result of um, some of the toxin uh, that's, uh, and some of the other chemicals that are uh, dumped into the body. So we have that, that bronchoconstriction. In addition to that, we have edema of the bronchioles. 
those bronchioles start to swell up a little bit and then start to leak. And what that will then do uh, is create some respiratory compromise because narrowing the airways, narrowing the air passages, and then starting to add fluid to it adds extra barriers, makes it that much more difficult for air to A, move in and out of the system, and B, be exchanged uh, through the capillary uh, alveolar uh, interface. When we look over on the cardiovascular side of things, with the vasodilation, um, in addition to um, some capillary permeability, so we're starting to leak some tissue, leak some fluids as well. Um, we have drops in blood pressure, pulses that weaken, and then poor tissue perfusion. Um, not to mention, it also causes swelling, something we refer to as angioedema, um, in various areas. So fluids are third spacing, and we have swelling uh, in, say, the tongue and the mouth, uh, which kind of uh, actually goes uh, on both sides of the house here mostly the respiratory side but um, so we have we have a lot of a lot of stuff going on here so an immediate threat to life is an anaphylactic reaction and anaphylaxis is a type of shock so these people very quickly progress they don't typically stick around in um, compensated shock for very long they decompensate pretty quickly and end up having very, uh, very rapid uh, progression into life-threatening emergencies. So keep in mind, uh, even though we have uh, a, a live talking patient, potentially, we can very quickly have the need to switch to resuscitation mode. So grabbing the AED on your way out of the ambulance is probably a good idea. You're probably not going to need it. You definitely don't need to probably go and apply it uh, as long as you have a, a conscious person. But you have it sitting there just in case. Um, you likewise need things for airway management. Um, airway management is, can be a, a huge problem. We can struggle with that uh, with a patient with a swollen airway. So BVNs, oxygen, and whatnot. Um, so when do we make this this determination between anaphylaxis and an allergic reaction. When does this become a big problem? When we are effectively seeing airway compromise and circulatory compromise, we're in anaphylaxis. So you have somebody who has maybe some swelling in their face or tongue. Flip the page to 669. The picture of a lady there was some pretty ridiculous angioedema of her tongue. Well, angioedema does not only come from an allergic reaction commonly comes from allergic reaction, but a, a certain class of medications called ACE inhibitors, and you're going to see this eventually, will cause that. So when do we say we're anaphylactic? Well, I have a swollen tongue. Okay, swollen tongue is somewhat concerning. Are you having difficulty breathing? Are you coughing? Are you spitting? Are you sputtering? Are you lightheaded? Are we starting to see tachycardia and dropping blood pressure? That's when you're in anaphylaxis. When do you need epinephrine? You need epinephrine when you start to have acute respiratory compromise and acute circulatory compromise. So otherwise, you're clear of the epinephrine. Remember, I've said in class that epinephrine is a nasty drug. It's hard on the body. So um, freely handing it out like candy can actually end up causing some some more severe side effects than they actually were dealing with with their emergency to begin with. Common things that will cause anaphylaxis uh, include um, uh, bees and wasp stings, um, substance uh, that is risk to others, so things such as um, peanuts, uh, latex, uh, certain food allergies such as uh, shellfish, um, and then these people will continue uh, with continued exposure to the antigen, antigen uh, worsen the patient uh, condition. Uh, so generally, people with an anaphylaxis, onset of anaphylaxis, aren't going to, uh, to heal or get better on their own without our intervention. 
people who have had a swollen tongue for three hours now and a little bit of a rash or an itchiness, but otherwise are fairly stable vital signs wise, um, they don't need us to jump in there with anaphylaxis or with, uh, I'm sorry, epinephrine to treat their anaphylaxis. Now, if your physician medical director has approved you to give the patient some oral diphenhydramine, which is the generic name of Benadryl, that may certainly benefit the patient. Uh, it, can, it can benefit uh, anaphylaxis patients as well as it can uh, benefit the, the standard allergic reaction patient. Um, it, it does have, the, you know, it's a, it's a pretty hefty uh, antihistamine. If you were to give it, you would generally give uh, two tablets, which in most cases is a total of 50 milligrams uh, to most adult patients. Uh, don't forget that uh, it does cause uh, sedation, so it can can make uh, our patients very tired. So, all right. So again, signs of anaphylaxis include swelling of the face and tongue, hives, strider, and wheezing, and may begin as early as 30 to 60 seconds after the exposure. Usually, it's a couple minutes. Rare, rare occasion. Um, you know, we're talking. Uh, much longer, 20, 30, 45 minutes later, um, but it certainly can occur. Um, so again, I can't emphasize this enough, and when we're having respiratory compromise and circulatory compromise is when we uh, draw that line in the sand to, to call it anaphylaxis. So other things that they may have, things like grunting, audible wheezing, uh, drowsiness, use of accessory muscles, uh, eventually they're going to get to the point in which they're just wiped out and they, they have uh, great fatigue, they can't hold themselves up, um, cyanosis or Haitian gray color. Don't forget that they often will also have things um, such as hives, which the medical term for that is urticaria. Uh, we're going to see a picture of that here shortly. Um, but uh, urticaria, which is hives, are raised, basically raised large welts uh, looking things. There's a video on uh, the use on anaphylaxis. Um, talks about it in the use of uh, an epinephrine auto injector. Remember, um, you can use an epinephrine auto injector if you don't have epinephrine auto injector available to you. I mean, that's certainly going to be the fastest thing. If you have an epi auto injector on your truck, hands down, you'll have that epi auto injector. Um, inspected and administered and in the sharps container uh, before you even get the, the 3.3 to 0.5 milligrams of epinephrine pulled up in your syringe. So if you've got it, you've got a true anaphylactic emergency going on here, use it. Um, yeah, yeah. We, we taught you how to do it with a needle in a syringe, but um, yeah, for, the sake of, for, for the sake of timeliness, and how quickly this person needs this treatment, then um, give them the auto injector. Then remember, this thing lasts only about 15, 10, 15, 20 at the best minutes um, that uh, they're going to potentially need a second dose of epinephrine. So if you have an extended transport time, by all means, uh, get another dose of epinephrine drawn up. Mark your syringe, you know, keep your fingers on your syringe or have it where only you know that, hey, it's been untampered with, and I know absolutely positively that this is it. Um, mark it if you can, um, and uh, that way you're ready to roll. So it produces this swelling that can obstruct the airway. Not only the tongue, but the tubes start to swell shut. Um, if necessary and we need to ventilate, then uh, manual airway maneuvers. We can use an advanced airway if we can get it to work. We can use some basic adjuncts. Um, endotracheal intubation that paramedics can do, or cricothyrotomy, in which paramedics can do, where we actually will cut, cut a hole or poke a hole through the throat, um, which most people think is a tracheostomy. Uh, but in an emergency setting, it's a cricothyrotomy. It's a different procedure. Um, those, those are the potentials for opening an airway for this person. Um, you know, and, and if you can't get paramedics and get them scoot into the emergency department uh, fairly quickly. So here's an example of hives or urticaria. Uh, remember, uh, there's another term that we need to throw in here, pruritus. 
uh, I believe we saw it in chapter 26, but pruritus uh, is uh, itching. So pruritus and urticaria are very common to our allergic reactions. Um, now, the more severe versions of it is hives or urticaria. Sometimes it's a fine petechial rash. And in 20, that chapter 26, we also talk about petechiae being very fine pinpoint little um, uh, rash that, that forms in certain occasions. So, um, and it, it's not always immediate. Now, remember that nobody is allergic to anything the first time they come into contact with it. So if it's the very first time you've come into contact with the substance now, as soon as I say that, sometimes there are, there are substances that are found within other products or other substances that we're unaware that we've been exposed to. But you have to have been exposed to it at one point in order for your body to build up a resistance to it. So the first time you're stung by a bee, you're not allergic to it. However, the second time you may be, or it might be the hundred and second time you may be. Um, so sometimes people uh, will just develop a minor allergy and that never goes any further. Sometimes people develop a minor allergy and slowly progress down to uh, a severe anaphylaxis uh, over subsequent exposures. So there's really not a rhyme or reason uh, to this. <clears throat> so again, while we're watching our uh, anaphylaxis patient, we're looking for the respiratory distress signs. We're looking for signs of shock. Now, granted, most patients are going to be slightly tachycardic going to be a little upset, a little concerned, but when we see um, marked, improve, or marked uh, increases in heart rates and maybe even start to see uh, blood pressure starting to drop, then we uh, are going to be concerned that this has progressed to the point in which they now have shock. Perform a rapid medical assessment, get a very quick uh, primary assessment on this person. Get them on some O2. They need the O2, so hopefully you've got the hands. Somebody can be doing some O2 airway stuff while somebody else is getting uh, a quick uh, assessment and somebody else is getting the epi ready. Um, and then very specifically looking for signs such as that urticaria. Uh, there's a video on the allergic rhinitis, which we don't need to, to dwell on. Um, I don't think I'm going to uh, to jump forward here yeah, yeah, we'll go ahead. Um, anaphylaxis, a couple things that we can also do for this person. In addition to our oxygen that we're providing for our patient, if we can get IV fluids, that can be beneficial. Remember, people in anaphylaxis have a distributive style shock, meaning that they have these very dilated vessels, not enough fluid to fill them. So sometimes a little bit of a fluid bolus is beneficial. We may need to ventilate them. Um, do some airway management, may need to suction, may need to put in an adjunct. Epinephrine, sub-Q, is generally for the adult, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams, sub-Q or IM. Again, auto-injector is fine, otherwise you can draw it up. Depending on your system, your medical control, um, whether or not you're allowed to do this, patients with very low blood pressures, below 70 systolic, Paramedics will often give IV epinephrine, the same dose of epinephrine, but IV form, and it's actually the 1 to 10,000, so the more diluted version of uh, epinephrine. Um, they will often give that, uh, the 1 to 1,000 epinephrine. If you give that IV, it's very, very, very nasty, and it, and it causes uh, a lot of potential uh, bad side effects with the heart. So the 1 to 10,000 or the more diluted version of epinephrine is what's given IV. You may or may not be able to do that uh, based off of your system. So duration of action of epi is fairly short, 10 to 20 minutes. Very powerful system, uh, uh, very powerful on the, on the cardiovascular system. Remember this is adrenaline. This is epinephrine just like we talk about your body secretes in fight or flight. Um, you may also want to consider, uh, I think I might have mentioned albuterol, but bronchodilator. If we give them a, an oral bronchodilator, or not an oral, an inhaled bronchodilator, um, we can help benefit 
uh, or actually improve the uh, vasoconstriction, I'm sorry, bronchoconstriction that they're having uh, in their respiratory tree. So don't forget, anaphylaxis, life-threatening emergency. Uh, they have problems with their ABCs. Quickly go into a, a uh, altered mental status, which is going to start out as being anxious and and uh, maybe progress to combative and then maybe potentially unresponsive. Uh, usually we'll also develop hypotension and tachycardia, which are some kind of key signs there. So the between the airway breathing problem and the cardiovascular problem, those being our hallmark signs of anaphylaxis. Um, and then often there's a history of anaphylaxis with a known history of exposure. Many times these patients have epi auto injectors. They may have medical alert bracelets and tags that, that tell you about their allergy. Um, but then again, occasionally, it's, it, it's always got to be the first time that somebody has one. So um, it may be the first time ever. They may not truly know. <clears throat> so hypersensitivity reactions. So we have allergic and anaphylactic reactions. So this is our, our body gets exposed to an antigen or an allergen, and then our body makes, uh, it has a, uh, a reaction to it. Uh, whether it is a very minor thing like a petechial rash or a little bit of, of pruritus and itching, um, maybe it's something like angioedema of the tongue, like this. Um, some of those things can be simple um, hypersensitivity reactions. Of course, the extreme cases are those people who have anaphylaxis, but there are a lot of minor cases. Several of us in class probably have some minor sensitivity reactions. Some people, it's it's certain metals like nickel or or cheaper jewelry um, that uh, their body uh, breaks out. I know several people who have pretty you know pretty uh, significant nickel uh, hypersensitivities, which if they don't don't put something between the snap on their pants and their abdomen, they start to break out. So uh, that's still a hypersensitivity reaction, it's still a, in the form of, a, of an allergic reaction, but it is not a life-threatening anaphylaxis. <clears throat> All right. So Sometimes uh, when we're talking about these, these mild sensitivity reactions, uh, we're just having localized events where we'll have uh, the T cells are responding and basically starting to cause a rash over hours to days. Um, I can, can give you a, an, an example of uh, when my oldest son was, uh, was very young. Uh, about, you know, he's probably around one year old or so, um, took him into the doctor for an ear infection or something like that. And uh, you know, eight days into his 10 days worth of penicillin, or penicillin-based drug, it was actually amoxicillin, uh, he started to develop um, this petechial rash and, and uh, obviously felt a little uncomfortable, probably itchy. So it can be extremely delayed like that. It was a very minor reaction. It had no respiratory involvement or anything. So um, we also have the immediate hypersensitivity response, which are those things that we start to see happen much quicker. So um, I would venture to guess that as as he's aged, he probably actually hasn't grown out of the um, penicillin base or penicillin family uh, allergy, mainly because of genetics. Um, uh, he's got uh, grandparents on both sides that have significant penicillin allergies. Uh, his mother has a significant penicillin allergy. His brother has a significant penicillin allergy, um, and uh, several other people in the in the you know not so not so extended family have histories of penicillin uh, issues. So he probably hasn't grown out of that, but uh, it's very possible that if 
if he were to be exposed to amoxicillin or penicillin again, that he would have a much quicker reaction or an immediate reaction. So it's just something that you you'd tend to not want to try. Um, so we have antigens entering our bodies in a number of ways, uh, whether we're talking things uh, that we've ingested, foods, medications, um, inhalation, uh, mainly pollen. Um, that's going to in most cases be kind of a chronic event more than anything. Injection, so insect venoms, medications, those sorts of things, um, or skin contact or absorption. Uh, so certain oils like poison ivy, latex. Uh, latex can also affect us uh, actually through inhalation because like putting on latex gloves will um, expose some of those proteins to the air and it suspend them in air and it will uh, you can bring them in that way and have a, an allergic reaction without even touching it. Um, so similar type of reaction called an anaphylactoid reaction can occur to certain substances such as dyes used in radiology procedures. So uh, they're the same as those of anaphylaxis, uh, but the reaction is actually not a result of the IgE reaction to the antigen. So <laughs> the example of the angioedema that we see on the patient uh, in the previous slide and uh, 669 on your textbook is most likely an anaphylactoid reaction in response to a certain medication. Uh, it's very common to see that ACE inhibitor class cause this. There are other classes that do it, but that, it, that's the most common time uh, to see this. Is, and it actually has to do with uh, some of the uh, pharmacology of how it works in the body, the pharmacodynamics of it. So this angioedema um, causes uh, the swelling, and in most cases it's to the face, to the the tongue. Uh, if you search uh, angioedema or anaphylaxis, do a Google image search, you'll see bazillions of great pictures. Some of them are pretty uh, pretty remarkable. So, um, all right, and so an IgE mediated allergic reaction causes a number of other chemical mediators, uh, and among those is histamine to respond. Um, and in milder cases, we'll have seasonal allergies. Um, that uh, give us some uncomfortable signs and symptoms, but are definitely not life-threatening. So. so again, signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. I keep harping on this because it's that important. Um, people die from this on a on a very regular basis. Uh, peripheral vasodilation and increased vascular permeability. Vessels get larger, and as the vessels get larger, the the walls of them basically expand and open up a little bit and allow for the seepage of fluids. Constriction of the bronchial and gastrointestinal muscle, so the smooth muscles. Um, itching, hives, and edema. Uh, distributive and or hypovolemic shock. Um, it's hypovolemic in the sense of it being um, relative to the size of their vessels. And then um, impending airway obstruction. So hoarseness, strider, uh, complete airway obstruction where they make no noise. Wheezing is usually um, our, our first signal. I mentioned that they may carry tags or, or have a allergic uh, identifiers. Many of them will carry epinephrine auto-injectors for self-administration. They usually are given several of them. So they can have one at home, one in the car, and actually in many cases they're told to have two, knowing that is or two on them, um, knowing that there's the the potential that it's going to run out over a period of 10 minutes or so. So these uh, epi auto injectors. Now note that there are several companies that create these epi auto injectors now. So a couple couple that we're going to look at here right now. First of all, uh, the top one is uh, what, what we commonly refer to as EpiPen. EpiPen is actually a brand name, uh, but uh, that is a, your standard epinephrine auto-injector. There's the adult version and there's the kid version. The adult version is yellow, the pediatric version is green, the adult version is 0 0.3 milligrams of epi, uh, the pediatric version is 0 0.15 or half that uh, dose. Simple auto-injector, uh, 
uh, pull the gray cap off, put the black part against the skin, um, press down, needle uh, fires in, you hold it for a count of 10, and then that epinephrine injection should be complete. Please note that the needle remains exposed, so be careful with it once you're done. Also, be careful you don't uh, put your thumb over the black end and then press down, otherwise you get a dose of epinephrine in your thumb. The newer version of these uh, is a little different. Uh, they've updated that, and it's got a, uh, a orangey end to it, which is the business side of things. So that's the warning, stay away from this end. And then there's a blue cap, blue safety cap, as opposed to the gray safety cap. Uh, they tell you put the blue, uh, blue point the blue towards the sky, and uh, stay away from the orange. Same basic principle. There are other ones. There's one that I've recently seen. It looks like a little cartridge or a deck of cards that uh, it, you pull the safe, you, you pull it out of its uh, protective packaging, and it actually talks to you. It tells you everything it needs you to do. Uh, it's called the AVQ. A V I'm sorry, A U V I dash Q um, Epi Auto Injector. So it tells you everything to do. I mean, it's it's almost foolproof. It doesn't tell you to take it out of your leg, but uh, I think most people figure that one out. And then there's the twin jack down below, which is actually kind of a nice one for AEMTs and paramedics. It is an auto injector and then a manual injection, both comes in that little green uh, case with a, a pocket clip, um, but uh, it works the same way as uh, our other auto injectors uh, do. Uh, in this case, um, it might be a little confusing because you pull the orange safety cap off, you put the green end uh, against the thigh, and you press down and it injects. Um, and then after you receive the dose from the twin jack, you can then um, actually from the first dose, you can unscrew the device, and I believe you, it's the green cap you see on there. You unscrew that green cap off of there, and there's a second dose in a uh, in a pre-filled syringe uh, that you can uh, give in uh, in 10 minutes or so. Uh, it's pretty cool. So this table um, is on uh, 669 in your text helps us compare and contrast uh, allergic reaction versus anaphylaxis. Onset, slower and gradual versus very rapid, can be delayed up to an hour. Uh, skin, you may have itching in hives, but in anaphylaxis it's more widespread as opposed to uh, a localized thing. Uh, they can be flush, they can be cyanotic, they can be gray. Uh, angioedema, may have some very mild edema uh, or swelling. Uh, typically in anaphylaxis, it becomes pretty uh, exaggerated, can be pretty severe, can cause complete airway obstruction. Mental status, we're typically normal, maybe slightly anxious, whereas we start out almost immediately anxious in anaphylaxis and then uh, head our way down to unresponsive. Lungs, you may have a little minor wheezing versus anaphylaxis, which you probably have significant wheezing and audible wheezing for that matter. Vital signs are normal versus developing hypotension, tachycardia, and respiratory distress. And then GI, something we probably aren't going to pay much attention to. You probably really in most allergic, mild allergic reactions will have really minimal GI uh, effect. Whereas with anaphylaxis, if you can if you can weep and seep, you will. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea are, are actually common if we uh, get that far through the process. So again, auto injectors, epinephrine, manual uh, epi as needed, uh, BVMs, ventilation, airway management, high flow oxygen or for ventilation as necessary to keep SATs above 95%. IVs are a good idea if you can get them uh, and try to get one early, however don't delay transport. Albuterol is, is appropriate um, for these people as well. I brought that up already. And then if your protocol allows, diphenhydramine oral can be used. So currently you can't do uh, IV diphenhydramine, uh, but uh, usually um, you know, if you've got a, a minor allergic reaction, uh, oral will be fine if you have an extended transport time. 
uh, oral would be fine as well. If you're really worried um, that this an that the uh, the event's going to reflare here, get paramedics on the way as soon as possible. That way, if they need to do advanced airway management, they can also use some um, IV Benadryl or diphenhydramine, as well as some steroids to kind of help uh, combat it a little bit. All right, so our think about it, signs and symptoms of allergic reactions, that's our body's way of ridding us of that antigen. So remember, flushing it out, closing off the airway to keep more from getting in, so on and so forth. Coughing, sneezing, watery eyes, that's us removing that antigen. So when we get it in our nose, we get it in our eyes, it makes us itch a little bit. The body's trying to wash it. The antigens also are going to say, let's get it out. We don't want it in our gut either. So let's move it along, increase our peristalsis, make it come out. And then our respiratory exposure, again, bronchoconstriction. So immunocompromise. Uh, people who are immunocompromised, they don't have uh, an effective um, uh, infectious disease control system. Their body is not able to uh, respond to these foreign uh, substances and or uh, infectious diseases uh, nearly as easily. Uh, we've talked about this in chapter 26. Uh, very, very briefly, we talked about people who are immunocompromised. Um, but the number of people who have cancers are immunocompromised. And usually that's cancers that affect the bone marrow. Uh, so the, the um, leukemias and uh, lymphomas and possibly the multiple myelomas have the potential to give us uh, uh, some immunocompromised state. Also, a number of people who have um, various medical issues, whether they have an autoimmune disorder that's knocked that out, uh, they maybe have had a transplant in which they're on drugs that help control uh, the immune response. So things to remember, um, looking for signs and symptoms of infection, such as a fever, cough, unexplained weight loss, night sweats. Remember, night sweats is not common to very many things. So uh, usually when we see night sweats pop up, severe night sweats, soak in the sheets, night sweats, uh, it's a sign of a, a pretty serious illness. You need to protect yourself and protect the patient. <clears throat> so again, there's a number of things that can cause this between the certain medications, the organ transplants, cancers, HIV and AIDS. Remember, that's the big thing that it does. It's, it destroys the immune system. So HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, and AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, uh, destroys that um, immunity. So there are much higher risk for different infectious diseases um, and then uh, certain cancers. Uh, here's an example of an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune is when the body actually starts to attack itself. It determines that some of its cells uh, or some of its tissues are not um, acceptable and tries to basically reject them. So uh, the body attacks itself or some of its own tissues. In this case, we're talking about psoriasis. Uh, psoriasis uh, is actually a fairly common uh, skin condition that is a, a uh, autoimmune disorder um, where the body will kind of build plaques on the outside, uh, uh, kind of a placky, flaky buildup uh, on the outside. Um, and more, more times than not, um, it's really kind of a cosmetic thing uh, is probably the worst part of it. It can, it can become a little bit more widespread, a little more severe, and it actually can cause some stiffening of the skin causes uh, can affect your movement and whatnot, but in most cases, uh, it's really more of a of a uh, annoyance than anything. The immune system then starts to break down some of these tissues. Um, so treatment is suppress the immune system. So whether that's going to be something like a cream for psoriasis in most cases. Rheumatoid arthritis is usually going to end up with something like a, um, an oral immunosuppressant because uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the body has an autoimmune um, reaction to many of the joints. So a lot of times it's knees, hands, fingers, 
ill bows that are the primary uh, affected ones. Um, they can have other things, fatigue and weight loss and, and whatnot, but for the most part, it's painful, swollen joints, some stiffness, and it usually leads down the line to deformity. Um, these are the people that you see with the giant knuckles and their fingers that don't go out straight anymore. They're all kind of contorted, curved, and, and uh, um, uh, angled very strangely uh, as uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Might have something like scleroderma. Uh, this is another skin issue, and it also affects blood vessels and other uh, general connective tissue. It starts to go in and develop and builds a scar tissue. So the skin becomes uh, it becomes hard, it's discolored, um, and it's almost like it's being replaced with bondo or plastic or or something like that. Uh, it looks like a scar; doesn't doesn't respond uh, nearly as normally. Um, the scleroderma, remember, when it also occurs on the inside, uh, can greatly af uh, affect numerous body um, functions. And then we also have uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE, uh, most common in, men, in women. 90% of them are women. Signs include fatigue, fever, joint pain, rash, and then it also pre can present and, and go pretty haywire into the kidneys, the heart, and the lungs can cause people to have, have to be on uh, kidney dialysis. Um, some cases require heart, lung, or kidney transplants, um, which is, is, is hard to justify because if the person has autoimmune disorder, they're still going to have the autoimmune disorder when they get the new, uh, new organ. So uh, it, can, it can make things very difficult. Um, so it starts to break down a lot of, of the, the connective tissues and the collagens. So things like bones can be involved. Um, and then people, even with diabetes, can have uh, an autoimmune disorder that their body's kind of affected uh, their pancreas and is starting to break down some of those things. Multiple sclerosis is another thing. Body's starting to kind of pick apart at the nervous system. So. It's a lot of, uh, of ugliness that occurs with autoimmune. Uh, there's a, a handful, uh, we've got this chart on it, 671 in your text, I've kind of covered it already. handful of drugs that you should pay attention to that people are on uh, for autoimmune disorders. Um, methotrexate, uh, Entanorecept, which is Enbrel, Prednisone, which is a steroid, and as most steroids. Adalimumab, which is Humira, and then uh, Stellara is less common, commonly used, but you do hear from it, hear of it from time to time, which is uh, Ustekinumab, which uh, all of those are uh, those UMAB drugs, as well as the Entanorecept, um, are all um, pills that are all uh, medications that help suppress the body's immune system. All right, so remember anaphylaxis is a severe hypersensitivity reaction. It causes vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, bronchoconstriction, and an increased gastrointestinal motility. It can also cause urticaria, airway edema, wheezing, and hypovolemia per se. Patients with anaphylaxis require aggressive management potentially requires uh, excessive and, and uh, aggressive advanced airway management. Our primary treatment is going to be uh, improving airways, oxygenation, and ventilation through the process of providing oxygen, ventilation where necessary, adjuncts, suction, uh, things like uh, an oral bronchodilator, or no, not oral, inhaled bronchodilator. Um, Epinephrine needs to come along fairly quickly in the process when it's an anaphylaxis. And then also fluids can be very beneficial. Patients with immunosuppression are at a much higher risk for infectious disease and certain cancers, although sometimes that infect, in fact, the immunosuppression comes from a type of cancer. And then patients with autoimmune diseases 
will often have condition in which their immune system fails to distinguish between themselves and their non-cells molecules and starts to destroy those tissues. That will be the end of this chapter.